and welcome back to We Bought a Mic, a podcast about movies, television, music, and chill catch up. We're catching up. We're taking a break from Tom and Tom to give you some thoughts on some things that we've been watching. That's what's on the docket of today's show. Welcome. My name's Ernest. A lot of things change, but war and podcasts, podcasts never change. I'm Hunter. And no Drew. That's that's a preview, a botched uh, botched line reading for me. I I should say, uh, currently incapacitated. This is a Zoom pod for for the people at home. I uh, I did injure myself. Um, that's why I was not on the last episode. Unfortunately, we did give uh, you a shout out. Uh, oh, you folks did? listen oh. to the uh, interview with the vampire episode. So um, you did you. You did tell people about like what happened, how um, I, there I might tried be to make it seem like you were interviewing a vampire and, and <sighs> that's what you were caught up with. But we did have to disclose that you did fall off a mountain. Yeah. So we should say that I, I, I wasn't interviewing a vampire, unfortunately. However, there is a prominent actor um, who we may or may not be doing a series about currently on this on the on the podcast feed. Um, and he he might be known for doing all of his own stunts. And let's just say (laughs) he called me up and he said, Hunter, we're we're in the middle of dead reckoning part two, formerly the movie formerly known as dead reckoning part two. I know that you have approximately six to nine inches on me, but I think that you're the closest fit. We need a big ski stunt. It's the, it's the climax of the film. And and I, I can't do and it. Tommy alone. was too scared. He just he he got a little scared, and he said, "I just have to call in for help." You've been a longtime friend of mine. Uh, this is uh, Tom Cruise saying this to me. Um, he said, uh, "You're the only other person who appreciates cinema as much as I do." Uh, so I just need you to fill in for this big ski stunt. And you know what? I took one for the team. I took one for Tom, um, and unfortunately was injured in the process. And now this is why you don't do your own studs. Just like Tom. Just like Tom was just in like Fallout. Tom. Yeah. And, and Mine is it, uh, arguably more impressive. Right. Because I won't yeah. get credit for it. And yeah, we'll see it in the final cut. Uh, yeah. Hopefully next next year when uh, Mission 8 comes out. On the We Bought a Mic press tour, I'm really going to like put out there that I tore my ACL for the podcast. Well, speaking of Mission Impossible Fallout, I think uh, one of the big ticket items we can start with is a show named fallout uh which you know you're basically what this episode is is dispatches from uh hunter laying in bed recovering and watching (laughs) stuff so you crush through the entirety of season one of fallout um and if folks uh don't want to hear the the discussion i don't know how spoilery we're about to get but you can find the timestamps below for all the things uh we're about to talk about so you can skip around but let's start with fallout um i haven't so seen the whole ask, thing how, how far have you gotten into this show because i don't uh, want to get super into spoilers or anything like that i just watched earlier today episode th- two okay uh yeah yeah it's just episode two Oh my God, I can't believe it's like already leaving my mind. <laughs> there's the first episode that introduces all our characters. And then there's the second episode that that's, it's like them kind of journeying out in the world a little bit. I think, I think that's it. I think that's all I've seen. Uh, yeah. The third one is when they start to kind of walk around. You start to uh, meet a little bit more of the, some of our characters maybe interacting with each other Here's a little a, bit. Here's a specific a lot thing. Of that. I'll allude to, I won't say exactly what it is because it's a spoiler, but it ends with a character uh, beheading another character. Okay. Yes. So that's the end of episode two. Okay. Um, so I will say, um, backing up a step, I uh, am like fully in the bag for Fallout. Like Fallout is truly like one of the most, Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas are like two of my favorite games ever. Um I've played and beaten like multiple playthroughs of those games. Really love them. Fallout 4, also a big fan of. When they announced this Fallout show, I was immediately against it. And then whenever I saw uh, our Westworld boys, Jonathan Nolan at the helm, I don't know if he's technically show running it, but 
heavily EPing it and directing I mean, multiple it episodes. Says, yeah, it says directed by Jonathan Nolan at the end of both of these first episodes. Yeah, whenever I saw that, I was like hard pass on this. There is no way that the show will be good. And fellas, I gotta say, I was kind of I was kind of blown away by how much I love this show and how much this worked for me. And yes, I know that this is like this is me getting a chance to experience some of that slop that uh you and other friends of the pod have been able to enjoy with like various comic book things and other yeah, stuff. You've, like you've slop been that's out made for on you. a lot of this stuff for the last few years. Like you, I, you I haven't have really dipped a bit of a toe on any of it. I've I've been on the sideline of slop, and god damn it, they got me. They fucking got <laughs> me because this show, I I thought it was pretty incredible. And like I'm saying that obviously coming from a biased place, as I mentioned, but I think that what the show does of striking the perfect through line of the black comedy of the satire while still also being able to find something uh, compelling and tell the story of power and these warring factions with each other and capitalism, uh, I think that the show kind of nails it. And I was – really shocked that it was able to strike this balance especially knowing that it's the fucking team that creates westworld which is like as melodramatic as it can possibly get i did not know that they had a uh, this feather in their quiver a, a show that started very strong a show with a truly like i would say excellent first season um that that show really descends into as close to garbage as you can get <laughs> um in seasons three and four but season one and and a lot of season two is very very strong so i wasn't fully out on this i'm definitely not as big of a fallout fan as you are but i am the the resident westworld defender on the podcast <laughs> so i i am still hanging on to a lot of what made that show special and i knew that there wasn't a total um you know that that there wasn't a total loss of any potential with fallout um so based on these first two episodes i definitely do think it lives within that slop designation which if folks don't know it's kind of our proprietary proprietary designation for like internet digital streaming content right like when you fire up your favorite streaming platform what are your eyeballs going to gravitate towards? Good old slop, right? And yeah. the best kind of slop that these streaming companies want to rely on is IP. It's yeah. things that are based on other things, right? So your Marvels, your Star Wars, um, you know, there's there's things that maybe started original and descended into slop. That would be something like Stranger Things. Um, but yeah, even Westworld, I would say Westworld started sure. from a prestigious place and then became full, full blown bad slot. It's, I would say it's a way to differentiate from something like the Irishman or Ripley, <laughs> yeah. which is a great show. Yes, I don't, I don't yes. think we'll have time to, to talk about that one on today's episode, but I am a few episodes into that and I am loving it. That is something a lot more artful. Right. It's something that lives alongside. It's the same size tile on your television, but it is an entirely different experience. Right. So when we talk about slop, we're talking about something that's it's a little crunchier. It's a little bit easier to digest. It's a little yeah. bit more like eating potato chips. Right. And, you know, it's something for the there's, masses. Yeah, there's a there's a place for that in in our entertainment Um world and and i think that fallout is kind of the best case scenario of this it's something that you you consume it and you don't necessarily feel like you're being taken advantage of by an algorithm or that you are you know a, a little oinky piggy just eating <laughs> slop out of a out of a trough like maybe maybe that's what it is but it doesn't necessarily feel that way it feels like something a little bit more thought through like like you can tell that there's some real effort put into this 
Now, right. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to be putting Fallout at my top 10 of the year. We'll see. Um, we'll see kind of how the whole season shakes out. Maybe you can give me a little bit of your take on on the full thing since you did watch it. But based on these first two episodes, I'm like, okay, I like it. I enjoy watching it. I can tell that a lot of work was put into it. I like this world. Um, it kind of makes me want to play Fallout <laughs> yeah. more so than continuing to watch it. I'm just like, man, Fallout's really cool. I should fire up uh, New Vegas or something. So I'm I'm on board, but I'm not necessarily like fully blown away or anything like that. Yeah. No, that's totally fair. I uh, I think that this show it just it it gets a lot of what makes the game specials right but not in a way that is like super mario movie like fucking beating the shit out of that nostalgia button until you go numb like it is actually it's it's paying homage to the tone and to the ideas of those games instead of just being like oh here's another easter egg here's another easter egg and i think that that's what is interesting one i will say the production design of this show, yeah, it's the like actual bright, look of it, poppy, it's colorful. It's it's got the fifty. It finds the right balance between the fifties kind of uh, Cold War type aesthetic, also with this like little bit. I don't want to call it grungier, but this like more uh, metal punky kind of yeah, vibe kind of to it whenever punk. you actually get out there yeah a little bit of that steampunk aesthetic um the actual color of it a lot of the practical stuff that they do in the show looks really really good um there's some cgi a little bit of cgi slop in there but that's that's kind of to be expected with these shows at this point um but you can tell that Amazon did drop a bag on this whenever it comes to the set designs to some of the locations so got to give them kudos to to that uh the world building around it is just really interesting and that's one of the things that i think gets better as the show goes on as the season goes on and as the world gets bigger you meet other factions and one of the great things is that there is no all good or all evil in this world everything every group every person that you see is complex and has their own personal interests that are leading them to think or to act in a certain way everybody has self-interest um and, so let, can i ask something about that because yeah, you're way yeah. more into the fallout lore than i am like to me fallout was a game that i perused a little bit and you know, kind of dabbled into some of the side quests, but didn't really go super hardcore into just going the main quest or anything like that. Honestly, Fallout 4 was probably the game that I spent the most time on, and it was like base building. <laughs> like that's what hooked me um, for some reason. Like the worst um, part about Fallout 4. Might be. I, yeah, I don't know. It, it, yeah, <laughs> you were uh, all in. <laughs> but how much does this show deviate from the established lore? Because I know it goes it goes deep with all these factions and the story that we're following is not necessarily adapted from a specific game. It's kind of grabbing components from all the games. Um, so does it is it kind of doing its own thing or do you feel like it's rooted in like pretty established stuff? So it's for the most part, I will say a lot of the factions that you see are already things that exist in the game. Now, because this is a television show, like it gives it the time to kind of flesh out more of these ideas. And one of the things I do appreciate is it does leave room to grow for further seasons down the road. It doesn't just it doesn't do the Westworld season one thing where it's like we have to blow our load everything right now in this season because we might not have a tomorrow. This they know that they've got something with the show, so they aren't trying to do everything immediately. Um, so like you do. But as far as to answer your question about the factions go, you do get the Brotherhood of Steel, um, which it's one is of the main kind characters. of like Maximus. Yeah, one. One of the main characters is uh, a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, which are this like kind of militaristic uh it, they're basically like the new military they're trying to use force to uh train and kind of break the wasteland and their 
ideals. Uh, then you have the vault tech people, which I think where, without getting into spoilers, where uh, the show goes as far as investigating vault tech and what the vault dwellers like stand for is very very interesting we get several flashbacks throughout the season to walton goggins character pre uh pre ghoulification pre like the events of the show Man, he the is having Monstrap. a blast you can Man, just tell walton he's goggins, loving it he is the mvp of the show he is absolutely incredible especially in some of these flashbacks and everything when he doesn't have go like full like i'm I'm ghoul outlaw of the wasteland. Yeah. <laughs> like it's in a lot of the episodes, in a lot of the scenes. Uh, if if people that, don't know, but one of the main reasons why we're not on video this week is because you are currently trying to not look like a ghoul. You're you're working yeah. really hard to to fight the uh, the radioactive fallout of the uh, of the mountain of the of the ski incident. Yeah, if people people can't see, but I actually have like a. I'm I'm free basing right away just right over <laughs> here. If you just hear a buzz in the background, um, no, like I I think that that's that's really what I'm getting back to about the thing that's interesting about the show and the thing that's interesting about the games is not necessarily the protagonists themselves, but the world around them and how you can kind of imprint yourself and your ideas on the different factions that you see around you that could also be used as a knock against the show um i do think that the two main characters um let me pull them up here ella purnell um from yellow jackets uh and aaron moton who i did not recognize from anything before um He's a pretty new new actor. I mean, he's been in a yeah. couple things like he was in the Emancipation of. and Father Stu. Uh, oh. Remember Father Stu? <laughs> Plays <laughs> Ham. Two years ago. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, relatively new actors, both of them in the in the show, and I I do think that both of them are good with the work that they're given. But a lot of the time, the interesting things are what's happening around them and not to them themselves that's yeah, one the thing world. that makes this that's what makes this different from something like uh the last of us which i think is a show that is going to be compared to this a lot for obvious reasons they're kind of the two most recent examples that we've gotten of like you can make vi video game adaptations work uh but they're also like so wholly different from each other and what they are trying to do Obviously, The Last of Us is trying to be more prestigious and trying to make more of these like character studies. And Fallout doesn't care about that. Fallout is trying to be a little bit of popcorn entertainment with some more grand ideas about capitalism and uh, well, you you kind of just human ethics <laughs> than than the end of the day. You also have to look at just the nature of those two adaptations and the how they've reached their you know their final form essentially fallout is on amazon prime what's amazon prime's biggest show or one of their biggest show the boys you can yeah there is a very uh, there's a lot close... of the boys in uh fallout yeah yeah exactly just the the sensibility the the wacko ultra violence is just very analogous there and then The Last of Us is over on HBO, comes from the creator of, of Chernobyl. Like that's a much more kind of grounded, um, uh, dramatic uh, approach. It's it's not going for for the wacky, crazy video game mm -hmm. stuff, but it's also the nature of that of the source material, right? Um, the the comparison to The Last of Us, I think, is very interesting because what Craig Mazin did is he basically took a story that was already it was already being handed to him as a very cinematic story and he just did it right like that's a great show not just because of craig mason's talents and all the things he added to it but because what was handed to him was already very very strong as a cinematic thing fallout is not doing that at all like it, it, that's not what the original game is it's it's a bethesda rpg like you are creating your own character you're making your own choices you're fleshing out your own path your own story in that world it's 
an entirely different video game experience from The Last of Us. So from an mm -hmm. adaptation standpoint, I think that it is interesting to, to pair them together, but the the distinctions have to be oh yeah very very clearly pointed out you know in, in what they're trying to accomplish they're two completely different forms of adaptation like i think that fallout is it just trying to be a pure adaptation a much cleaner version than the last of us because the last of us is trying to do more new more brand new stuff with all these new characters and flashbacks and everything else in the world so it's the comparison makes sense, but a different in a lot of ways, it's like apples to oranges as far as the quality, uh, the the types of shows that they want to be. I do want to point out um, because I think the first two episodes of Fallout, especially, go really all in on that black comedy, on some of the explosive, loud elements of the zany elements of the world. There is a lot of heart in this show too. And that did kind of surprise me where this where that went. Uh, episode four, the ghouls kind of explores a little bit. Uh, it goes a little bit deeper into who ghouls are. Ghouls are just humans who got like kind of fucked by this world that's around them. And like there, there's lots of those ideas, especially coming back to the vault stuff that is really interesting. It does make you feel whenever you are watching the show and that I, that I think was the most surprising element because once I realized that the show was fun, I was like, cool, I can just like have fun with this. This can be slop that I can be multitasking or whatever else on. And I found myself really locked into each of these episodes. So that's great. I news. recommend high, high recommend. We'll check back. One of in. my favorite things I have seen this year so far without a doubt. Yeah. I'll, I'll be, I'll be watching through the rest of it for sure. And we'll check back in that's fallout on prime. Um, we have a bunch of movies we want to talk about, but I wanted to uh, do a little quick fire of some other TV items here. Um, I watched, staying on a, on Prime, I watched uh, Invincible Season 2, which split its season into two parts. I think part one aired last year, and we kind of mentioned it, but not really because we were waiting for part two. Um, so part two is out now. I watched the whole thing. I really enjoyed it, but I felt like it was almost like a transitionary season, mm -hmm. setting like resetting a lot of things and setting things up for season three. Um, it, it didn't feel necessarily as consequential as as maybe I I'd hoped. Um, so not necessarily a disappointment, but just like an okay. That was that was good. That was that was fun. Uh, have you seen any of Invincible season two? No, I haven't even watched the the half from last year yet because I was just waiting for it to all come out. Um, yeah, that's you know that's a little bit disappointing based on I think that both of us had this in our top ten of the year season yeah, one whenever the, the, it came the out the first season. Yeah, it was just yeah. kind of this huge bomb of a. Not a bomb in a good way, just like kind of blowing it everyone's expectations out of the water. Yeah, so that's a little bit disappointing to hear that the the quality dipped a bit. I'm still really interested to watch the show. I think that this is another show that has a lot of interesting ideas. Um, I even once upon a time wrote a piece about the show around season one, talking about uh, where the superhero genre was going and how it's kind of moving into this new stage and then ending uh, fast forward to last year where like every superhero movie bombed. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in checking out the show and then we can. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I wouldn't say yeah. it was, it was bad or disappointing. It, it just, again, it just felt a little, a little lighter compared to season one. Cause season one just felt like, Holy shit. Like just the slap in the face. This one was like, okay, we're, we're progressing the characters a little bit. There's a lot of characters in this show. That was kind of something a little weird. Is just uh, maybe we should trim up some of these, uh, you know, tertiary characters and kind of focus in a little bit on on our our core crew. Um, but I am excited for where the story is going. They they managed to kind of. Uh, you know, go in, into some interesting places and 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 keep things interesting and and not have it feel like we're totally uh, in a hamster wheel or anything like that. Um, so that's Invincible. Staying on 
uh animation a lot of people are talking about x-men 97 um and i wanted to fire off a, a quick take that i am really enjoying it there's a new episode out today that i'm very excited to see um it's a continuation of the classic x-men 90 show and my wife and i are really enjoying watching this together it's i don't know it's it's not anything groundbreaking although part of me does feel like it has potential to be best of the year material because oh, wow okay the, because the x-men are just they're they're great like if you do the x-men right it's one of the best stories uh those characters that world those themes it, it's just there's a lot there you know going back to the adaptation point it's like you have a lot there to work with if you just do it it's top shelf stuff so they are doing it it's kind of weird they're kind of running through it at a pretty fast clip um storylines that must have taken uh a, you know, many many issues in the comics um they're just cramming them into a single episode and doing a pretty great job at it i'll say um and not just doing it one to one like kind of putting a, a interesting twist on these stories so i don't know I, I i've seen a lot of takes out there a lot of people um i think a lot of people older people that grew up reading these comics and know these characters and these storylines like the back of their hand and watch the the original show maybe aren't super into this or maybe if they are it's just for pure nostalgia but i'm not that like i'm not that steeped into x-men lore so to me i'm just i'm just along for the ride i'm just like enjoying the shit out of the show and 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 just finding it one of the more exciting things in in my rotation right now so i, I definitely watch, recommend it did you watch this old animated show a good bit not not the whole thing but yeah okay. a, a big chunk of it and now i'm actually going back to it now in between because these are weekly episodes uh so in between waiting for each episode each week i'm like all right let's let's run it back it's obviously like very dated and a lot of the episodes you just feel like okay this is for children um but it's there's a lot there for adults too like the, the x-men have always been one of the more interesting uh comic book stories you know it, it deals with themes of uh oppression and segregation and uh you know marginalized people whether that's race or sexuality um and it's always very dramatic you know there's never yeah. an episode where they're just having a picnic it's always just like love triangles and <laughs> betrayal <laughs> and <laughs> it's it's very like heightened soap opera stuff so you you're, you're always going to be entertained you know, I I think I watched some of this original show back in the day, but like I was I was more of a Spidey a Spidey boy personally. Yeah. Yeah. Like I watched a lot more of the animated Spider series than I did X Men uh, from the nineties. But I'm I'm interested in this show. I'm glad that like they are doing the right thing by releasing this weekly. I. Yeah, building going back hype. to fallout for a second i don't know why they dropped this all at once amazon prime did i think that was like a massive mistake and i think that if i had to make a guess i would guess that season two they won't do that or they'll do the thing where they drop half the season and then like wait a bit and then drop the other half yeah or like two like or that. three two or three at once and then weekly i think i think that's what they yeah, do with the boys that's, that's what they do with the boys yeah so i wouldn't be surprised if they did that now that fallout has been well received um but x-men has just been kind of owning a lot of the the podcasts and a lot of people have been talking about it now for several weeks and it's it's a very smart thing to do so i'm, I'm right, intrigued two, two more quick ones jumping over to netflix land um the vince staple show dropped a couple months ago now like two months ago now um it's only five episodes and they're all very short so this the entirety of this single season is probably like less than two hours i want to say like a vince staples album that's like 22 minutes long yeah. <laughs> he had to make the shortest tv show exactly <laughs> my exactly. guy likes to be in and out <laughs> um 
I really liked it. it. It gave me vibes of Atlanta. I don't know if any Atlanta people are are involved in this. I know it's mostly him, um, and then a few other folks that uh, kind of help him with um, you know fleshing out the the concepts. But it does have that Atlanta vibe of just like here's a a, a rapper, right? So he's playing himself essentially uh, in situations that are either very specific to his experience or a little surreal and a little weird and a little bit removed from our reality so it it definitely kind of scratched that same itch uh of the uh the best stuff that we that we love from atlanta so um really fun just super short i don't know if he's going to do any more um but i'm glad it exists oh yeah i man i love in staples so this is a uh... Definitely on my list to uh, check out before we before we get to year end. And then uh, the three body problem um, was a big big time release from Netflix last month, based on a book, a uh, Chinese novel. Um, this is a show, you know, kind of going back to the slop conversation, where this you can this show comes from uh, the Game of Thrones guys. David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. This is their essentially their follow-up to Game of Thrones. And this show, you can tell that so much work was put into it. It is massive. There are huge ideas. It is, it, it, it feels, you know, like, like the follow-up to Game of Thrones, right? Like it's this massive adaptation. It's a sci-fi story. It's not fantasy. But there's something about it where it just feels a little hollow. It just feels like I am watching something massive, but I it doesn't feel massive, right? Does that make sense? Like you can tell. Yeah, it's the the, ne- can the Netflixification yes, of everything. Exactly. It's like you see it in front of you. You can observe how kind of seismic and monumental this story is, but. It, it, you're not processing it that way. You're you're processing it in a, in a much more just yeah, like I was saying, like crunchy potato chips that don't satiate you. They don't leave you like f- feeling like you're well fed. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't necessarily say the show is bad. Um, I think there's some good stuff in there. Uh, I like the cast, um, and I like the concepts. It's very heady sci-fi stuff. It's essentially a story about um an alien invasion but it's unlike any other in- alien invasion story i've seen it's essentially what if we knew that aliens were coming 400 years from now right they're traveling they're on the way here we know they're going to get here but it's going to take them 400 years right so the the the, the story kind of goes from there and the way that impacts our characters goes from there um and it, it kind of has these dual timelines, one in the present, one um, in the past, um, in in China, in like 60s, 70s, 80s China. Um, so it's it's engrossing, you know, it, it pulls you in. I, I think I binged this thing in like two or three days. It just, it's one of those where every time an episode ends, you're like, all right, I got to keep going. They got me. They got me. And I burned through, yeah, the the eight episodes pretty quickly, but then it it doesn't feel like it leaves that much of an impact, right? You there might be an episode like episode five is kind of the 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 big flashiest one where it has a major moment that a lot of people have been comparing it to the red wedding, but it's not it's not at that level. It's just you know it's something kind of like that like kind of shocking like that um and you know it's it's fine i would say it's fine um nothing groundbreaking but i i am fascinated by the choice of the game of thrones guys coming over to netflix to do this big big flashy adaptation they dump all the episodes and now it's like okay all right 
There it is. It's just gone. Yeah. <laughs> it'll sit in, it'll sit in the top 10 for like another 2 weeks and then it'll disappear completely. Yeah. I so is this just is this a mini series or will there be more seasons of this? Well, there are more books. So okay. from what I've heard, they incorporated a couple things from book 2 and 3 into this season. They they made some some adaptation choices. Um but We'll see. I mean, I don't think a second season has been um, announced. I think reviews were pretty mixed. So I don't know. I think we'll see. Y- you seem to be in line with a lot of things I've heard, which is like, it's pretty good. And like, that's kind of it, which is like, I mean, again, it'll like live in the top 10 for a while because what even is the top 10, but Netflix controlling what they want you to watch. <laughs> so like, I, I'm sure that the budget for this was stupid it was like actually you know i wonder what the budget for the show was um i don't know if netflix is quick to release that kind of information uh estimated reported budget of 20 million an episode for eight episodes so Jeez. we are talking what is like that almost Quick like math? 160 mil? yeah yeah maybe 200 um, Damn. yeah yeah probably press and everything else so Netflix wants this to be a hit. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens and if this is Netflix. I think that they know Netflix is a little bit in a corner right now. They've had big regime changes with who is in charge, who is making the decisions, and who is making the the movies side of things. TV is a little bit of an existential crisis because the Stranger Things kids uh, ain't getting any younger. Oh, they ain't uh, kids. That's. They ain't kids no more. They are young adults, uh, just full on adults at this point. Um, and I think like life without str- life post Stranger Things is a little bit scary for Netflix. Um, not too scary because they still have like such a massive share of audience attention right now over everybody else, all of their competitors. But yeah, I, I think that three body problem, I think they wanted it to be a little bit higher reception. Yeah, than absolutely. What it's getting getting Benny off advice. Like, of course, yeah. they wanted it to be bigger. And the 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 book is like very popular from what I know. Um, people really, really love that book. So I, I'm sure that they were hoping that it would be a little bit better received. I, I don't know what the viewer data is on it. Might be one of their most watched things of the year so far. But yeah, I I don't know. We'll see. Maybe a yeah. season two might kind of fix some of the issues a little bit more. Um, it, it does leave things off in a pretty interesting place where I, I would be very interested in a second season. And, you know, despite my qualms with it, the uh, the sci-fi ideas that it discusses are really, really fascinating. Um and it, it just gets into some really nerdy, weird shit that I love to think about. The story doesn't necessarily like grapple with it in, in as dramatic and a compelling way as I would like it to. But just kind of thinking about the concepts is it's it's cool to me. So that's three bo- body problem. It's on Netflix. Um, last TV item, um, Shogun on yeah. hulu i haven't kept up with it as much as i would like to i think i've only seen the first episode and i just keep meaning to get back to it but i'm just like uh, i i don't know i i i loved it i love the first episode but i just i just have been unable to make time for it how much of it have you seen um so i am fully caught up I okay. am caught up and ready for the last so episode. Tell us, coming tell us this about week. Shogun. Um, this show, in a lot of ways, I feel like is the show of the year so far. Um, this was, I was really excited just by a lot of the press material for the show before it ever actually, I think it got released. The first three or four episodes got released to critics early. Um, and people were pretty much like over the mood for the show. So I was excited for it. Um, held up not leaving my house anyways so i'm like hey might as well just dive right into this thing and it's just it's kind of expertly crafted top to bottom um it's whenever you're talking about so basic kind of premise for the show is that they're 
It's is, a prequel to Silence, to Scorsese's Silence. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, so there's these kind of two worlds that become intermixed with each other. One of them is following uh, lo- one of the the lords of this uh, feudal Japan. I think it's based on like uh, night. 19- or 1500s six early 1600s i want to say um based on like that era of japan uh where well, they based have on this a grand novel council. 1975 yes. novel i'm not sure how much of that novel is like non-fiction or if it is like dramatized or what exactly the novel is it says it's um, it's historical fiction historical fiction okay so there you go um i'm sure it's like based a lot on the area because a lot of the craft that is put into the show, it is like very clear that like, oh, this is there's a real level of attention to detail in the show. But getting back to the premise, essentially, there is one of the lords of this high council is being accused of treachery and trying to take over all of Japan and create his own shogunate. Um and that is leading to this budding war that is on the horizon. And it's kind of like a lot of it is like Game of Thrones, but early Game of Thrones before the battles take place. Not to say that there isn't any action in the show because there is some of it, but this is much more about like men in rooms talking to each other and politicking with each other than it is about grand battles, which that's frankly much more interesting than people punching each other or in this case slicing each other with swords <laughs> um so that's happening and then meanwhile there's this character john blackthorn uh who is a englishman who gets caught his boat gets caught as he's trying to traverse through uh i i don't remember the exact reason where he's originally trying to go essentially he's trying to be like a merchant trying to be a tradesman there and he is also a protestant and at this point in japan uh japan is has a heavy heavy catholic influence from the portuguese there um so john blackthorn is also there to kind of take out the catholic stranglehold that is encompassing not only japan's religious ideologies but also helping portugal control all of the trade that is coming out of this country uh and making their own monopoly from the silk trade and everything else so there are these two worlds that are going on interstitialed within each other and i hesitate to get much more into the plot of everything that's happening with the show because it does get pretty deep I will just say that, like, there's kind of no weak, there's no chinks in the armor of this show. Uh, the casting is absolutely incredible. Um, the guy who plays John Blackthorn, he is quite good. But really, um, my two favorite performances are the the Lord who is leaving, who is trying to seize maybe problems with the high councils. And he's one of the main protag- protagonists that we follow. Um Hiroyuki Sanada, uh, who plays a uh, Lord Toronaga, who, and then, who's a, a a guy like you recognize this yeah. guy's face. He has been around, and it's like a I feel like it's like a very big deal that he's getting this role because he's yeah. always just been like, you know, a he, Japanese guy <laughs> on the sidelines of a bunch it, of stuff. Yeah, exactly. He was in like fucking The Last Samurai and he played Scorpion in the Mortal Kombat movie and like 47 Ronin he, and like he gets he's killed just, by Jeremy Renner in Avengers Endgame. He yes, that's a thing that happens. He's in John Wick Chapter 4. Like he has kind of just always been around in things, but this is the first time at least for American audiences where he is really getting to showcase like no, I I got the chops. I I got the goods right here. Um, also in Westworld. He's in Westworld. Who's yeah. he in Westworld? Yeah, when and when they go to Japan land. Oh Jesus Christ! So <laughs> slop. He's in Slop World, is what you're telling me. Um, no, and the other person I want to shout out is uh the woman who plays Mariko. Um, Anna Sawai. Um, I. Anasiwa, I'm so sorry, I'm totally butchering her name, who is like 
a pretty unknown person to me. She's actually in um, the Park Chan Wook show, uh, Pachinko, that's on Apple, but uh, never saw it, uh, unfortunately. Oh, she's also in F9, the Fast Saga. Couldn't tell you who she was in that one, but um, she is absolutely incredible. Her character, Mariko's story, is probably the most interesting through line of the show because she really connects these two worlds to each other. Um, she is, in addition to being like a uh, a lady in the world, is very fluent in English, so acts as a translator for our boy John Blackthorn, and it's just. It, it's really just expertly done. Like, I can't recommend this show enough. It definitely is a show that, like, it's heavily subtitled. So you got to be locked in for it. It's not a show no that second you can screen. just, like, you can't second screen it because guess what? They aren't talking in a language that you know. Um, apparently, I think that there is a dub version of this on Hulu. Don't fucking watch that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Well, yeah, because it, it airs on on FX, like on cable, right? So that's that might be the version they air. Does it actually? Oh, this is an actual FX show. It's not a FX on Hulu show. I, I'm pretty sure they've been airing it on FX because it's don't a know weekly anymore. show. Well, because the bear. Well, yeah, I guess you're right because the bear just drops all at once because it's FX on Hulu. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I cannot. F I don't know what FX is doing anymore, but they are releasing quality stuff. And I want to do like a more in-depth episode on the show once you've had a chance to. It's about to, to wrap get up, into right? It because it's. Yeah, many, the last episode like is this week. OK. This coming week. Um, Just a lot of the ideas that it's going for here. They're things that we've seen before, but not with this type of story uh tales of power of religion and of kind of back tabling to control power and it's it's just it's really compelling and interesting i i really love it a lot without getting into more details of the specific twists and turns that the the show goes down i think the um the subtitles might be one of the reasons why i haven't uh gone back to it because i know I need to lock in and so many of these other things we talked about on this episode are just like, yeah, I can just throw that on and like not really pay that yeah. much attention to it. This one's like, no, you gotta, you gotta tap in. So that's, it's that's tough. why I've been, I've been, uh, uh, procrastinating it. It's, it's fair. It definitely makes sense. I, I been there. So I completely understand that. I, I will say like, it's funny. Cause I feel like I, like half watched the first episode and maybe watched it over like multiple sittings. So whenever you meet characters later on, I was like, wait, who the fuck is this guy again? Yeah, I gotta go and the back. show does like, I, I never had to go back to ep one, but I had to do a little bit of like, okay, this guy's re connected to that guy and they're nephews, but like, he's actually more sided with this guy over there. So like, you got to do a little bit of that, but no Sounds more like than you have to do with, yeah, I was going to say, literally no the more wiki. than you have to do with Game of Thrones. Yeah, so, oh, great show. Shogun. I am very, very excited to get into it. I've heard nothing but glowing things from everybody. So, yeah, I I will tap in. I will. Um, all right, let's get you, to it. Go ahead. Real go quick, ahead. I just want to ask. Um, we don't have to get too into it today because I have not watched all of it. How far into Ripley are you? Uh, so there's there's eight episodes they all dropped it once on netflix i'm i'm really trying to savor it and that's one that lee and i are watching together so i i, I cannot watch ahead um i watched i think four yeah so uh, right at the halfway point okay so okay. i watched i watched four out of eight okay you've seen you're an ep ahead of me i just started earlier today i'm three ups in and it's so i love good. this show it is like one of the best looking things that i've seen in a long time every it's shot just is just like wow phenomenal <laughs> which they do have i've said it before but like the biggest cheat code that you can have is just shooting something in the italian countryside yeah. and <laughs> this, this show spares no expense there that they're just yeah. like when in doubt let's cast a, like the most gorgeous cliff side villa that you've ever seen in your life but you can you, you can still white. tell that they put a lot of 
thought into the, just the exact framing of every oh, yeah. single shot. Yeah. Also, just Andrew Scott. Oh this my is, god, dude, he's so man, fucking good, our man. Fucking king. He I love incredible. watching him just walk up and down stairs. Like I could just watch that forever. Just the way he moves his body, the way he puts his hands in his jacket pockets. I'm like, god yeah. damn. The way so he's done it twice with two different people so far, but like Andrew Scott, because it's supposed to be the character Tom Ripley's. He's, he's you know he's a con man. He's this is based on talented Mr. Ripley. A lot of people know the story, everything. He's a con man. But like the impressions that Andrew Scott is able to do first of um, the Freddy uh, actor in the show. And then that he does later on when he is minor, minor spoiler alerts, uh, dressing up as Dickie and like doing the voice and everything. I was like, oh, my God, Andrew Scott, Jesus Christ, give this guy a fucking Emmy. He's this unreal. Is unreal. He is absolutely unreal. unreal. Yeah. No, I, I think that this show might be a lock for like maybe my top five or top three of the year. Like it is so, so fucking good. I am yeah. I am blown away. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm savoring it. You know, it's like um it's like a nice bottle of wine. You know, you don't want to chug it. You wanna sure. you, you wanna sip on it. Um, okay. So let's get to movies. Um, right now in uh, good old Orlando, Florida, we have the Florida Film Festival happening right now during this recording. Um, and we we're able to get uh, press access to the festival. So we're very excited to cover it. I did get a chance to check out a couple movies. Um, one of them is called Riley. Um, and it is directed by Benjamin Howard. Um, very small movie. The all of these movies are very indie movies. We're not seeing like major studio premieres uh, here. Um, and this is a story of a young boy in high school who is uh, struggling with coming out uh, as gay, maybe bi. That's you know that kind of trying to figure out what kind of not straight he is. Is this anguish that's sort of haunting him and and causing him to kind of spiral a little bit um and then balancing uh being a football player um so i thought that this movie had a lot of going for it in terms of putting you in this kid's uh psyche and and this anguish um but i also think that just the idea of a coming out story feels a little bit dated in 2024 um, just because it's so much more accepted now and it doesn't feel like it's something that should cause somebody this much anguish. But I thought that the performance, uh, the main character is played by Jake Hawley, was very, very strong. This kid is very talented. I didn't necessarily buy the athlete portion as much. Uh, I, you know, I don't see a guy wearing this much eyeliner uh, being a wide receiver uh necessarily but the feeling is there right the emotion is there of what this kid must be going through um and the the rest of the cast i thought was really great too there's this guy named quinn sky who plays the more out uh gay friend oh wait no i'm sorry i got these names mixed up riley quinn scott is the girlfriend who has to uh, discover that her uh, boyfriend may not be uh, may not be straight. Um, but the other kid, uh, Connor Story, yes, this is who I was looking for. He's like the more gay uh, out uh, gay f friend um, that sort of pulls Riley out of his comfort zone a little bit to get him to try to embrace. Um, who he really is. I would love to see this guy in more stuff. He, you know, there's always, when you see movies at film festivals, like there's always, uh, you always see like one uh, actor who just pops, right? And this is, I thought was just a really, really popping performance. Uh, every scene that this guy uh, did, I was just locked into the screen. I was like, man, this, what a talent. 
uh, Connor story. Um, so yeah, nice little movie. Um, maybe, you know, a little bit sort of, uh, neither here or there in, in terms of the themes of it, but I thought the talent was very, very strong. Um, that's Riley direct written and directed by, uh, Benjamin Howard. Um, and then the other one I got a chance to see is called Booger. Um, very, very different movie. This one is about a woman who is grieving the loss of her roommate uh, and is sent into this mental spiral, just completely consumed by by the grief and the loss, and essentially con uh, convinces herself that she's turning into a cat. So <laughs> the movie is uh, essentially you're in her POV as she is unable to uh, cope with the loss of her roommate. Uh, and then the, I thought the performance was really, really crazy, really good of just her becoming a cat. <laughs> she starts doing this purring thing, uh, that I thought was really, really cool. Um, and they managed to do some great visual stuff to really sell this descent into madness. Um, I thought maybe the the balancing of the tones could have been a little stronger balancing the the wacky crazy insane gross out body horror stuff with the more dramatic um uh grief and and loss of a loved one stuff um but i really enjoyed it uh good kitty acting in the movie and yeah this main girl grace uh glau wiki uh, I thought knocked it out of the park, just becoming a cat and really wilding out. Um, so it's a wow. booger directed by Mary Dotterman. So those were the two movies that I got a chance to see at the Florida Film Festival so far. We might have uh, some more because we're right in the middle of it right now. Um, so in a future episode, we might be able to cover some uh, additional uh, films. Yeah, no, I'm a. Uh... I I'm, haven't been able to go to anything yet, uh, but I'm very excited to blame go Tom Cruise I, for the stunt yeah, work. I, Tommy, you are you say that you love cinema, but you're preventing me from supporting indie <laughs> filmmaking. Um, no, I always I do love like going to some of these smaller film festivals and like discovering some movies or some actors that even if like this isn't going to be like a huge spirit award winner or anything like this like you can see the stepping stones for something i i think back to a couple years ago whenever we saw catch the fair one and that was one of those movies that we saw and immediately we're just like hey kelly reese is something here like i i don't know if what this movie will be long term and like it's a movie that we all really enjoyed but like it was like you see that performance and then now she's a co-lead with Jodie Foster and HBO show. Like right. it's a thing. And on to more exciting stuff beyond. Yeah. So that's a uh, very exciting. Glad to hear there's been some good stuff so far. Yeah. Yeah. Love, love, uh, uh supporting local film and, uh, just being a part of the Florida film festival. I've always wanted to, to check it out. I'm, I'm glad we're getting a, a chance to dip our, our toes into it a little bit this year. Um, yeah, the, the local community here with the Enzian uh, is great. So love to see it. Love to be a part of it. All right. Couple last uh, entries here before we close out. Uh, I had a chance to see Civil War, the new movie by Alex Garland, director of films such as Ex Machina, Annihilation, and Men. Of course, um, Men. I don't think we ever like really talked about men on this podcast. We <laughs> kind of like, needed to <laughs> avoided it entirely, but it, it, it might have been nominated for some some bad wabamis at the end of the year. I think I, I, I think it was remember, um but, yeah, uh, I think it was the the good for you bud award. It was definitely yeah. it was definitely up for that one. It was like I you probably should have just paid for therapy lessons that might have been cheaper. Um yeah, <laughs> a, a movie a movie that I didn't outright hate but i thought was kind of a swing and a miss 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a movie that leaves a bit of a. I didn't hate while watching it, but it did leave a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, and it's kind of like soured in my brain over time. Yeah, I, I'm looking at my letterbox right now. I initially gave it a three and a half. I'd probably knock it down to a three, just because it it just doesn't feel like it really. I don't know. Like I got everything that was intended out of it. Um, it's a very bold movie. That final set piece is just one of the most insane things I've ever seen. But it's also like, why? You know, what? what's the <laughs> point? Um, so now Civil War, I think, is, is a bit of a bounce back for Mr. Garland. This is the biggest movie that A24 has ever released. I think it has like a $50 million budget. It was number one at the box office this past weekend, 25 million dollar opening it's officially a24's biggest box office success um at least in its opening i i don't know how it'll do um total um you know i <laughs> we'll see how it does the second weekend and if it sticks around i i think the one of the 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 craziest things about it has been the discussion around civil war and honestly that's what been one of my favorite things about it is coming out of the movie i was kind of left scratching my head with a lot of what it was trying to do and reading reviews and listening to podcasts and and kind of taking in analysis of the movie has been one of my favorite things and i i love when that happens i love when i watch a movie and i'm like hmm i'm not sure about a a few of the the things here and then i consume like other people's interpretations and it sort of amplifies my uh estimation of the film you know and i don't know if that's necessarily what alex garland intended i think he did intend to not push the the scale in a lot of ways and i think that that's a lot of the problems that the the people have with the movie the fact that it's called civil war and it doesn't really explain a lot about what the civil war actually is um but I am very much enjoying, like, you know, consuming everyone's interpretations of what they think does and doesn't work in the movie. I think from a very bare bones uh, movie watching experience, I think it's pretty incredible um, just sitting there and, and watching the images and hearing the sounds. I was pretty captivated. There are a lot of sequences in this movie that are kind of like um, they they kind of took me aback with how visceral they were, like kind of gutting uh, and violent and and tense and thrilling. Um, there's some choices. I, I don't want to get into too many specifics because there's some fun in, in discovering some of these choices, but there's some stuff that I was kind of like, ah, that didn't quite work. I don't know if that was the exact thing that I would have done in, in that moment. But Garland is clearly trying to provoke in certain ways, which is weird because the movie is about photojournalists trying to document this war and trying to be as objective about it. So the movie is trying to be objective. But then it's also trying to insert these little bits, these little moments of provocation, sometimes by not by trying to not make a choice. Um, so I I am being weirdly vague, but it's the movie is not just this bland thing that doesn't pick a side. That's not what it is. The the movie does have a point of view. It's just very obscured. And it's trying to be very artful about how it's going. Um, so, you know, I am tossing it in my head a lot. And I, I do think that there's a lot of it that's very, it's very silly. You know, I, I was sitting there watching and I was like, eh, I feel like I'm having to suspend my disbelief a little too much here. Um, but it does have some interesting ideas on its mind specifically about what would happen in this scenario 
if a civil war were to break out in America, what would it actually be like? Not not what would lead to it. I think that's the trouble that this movie yeah. is in is like the the reasons why the war in this movie breaks out kind of they kind of don't make any sense. Like there's no <laughs> good explanation for it. it it's you kind of have to throw that out the window. But once you're in it, once you're actually having to experience, that's I think the 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 fascinating sort of swirling gray area that the movie finds itself in, where the, I'll give away a, a tiny little moment in the movie. There's a there's a sequence when our our main characters, our journalists, encounter um, a pair of snipers that are shooting another sniper. And they're trying to talk to them, you know, doing their journalism thing, trying to ask what's happening. And they basically say, that guy is trying to kill us. We're trying to kill him. That's it. So a moment like that really makes you think about what Garland is trying to say with this movie and the feeling that he's trying to put you in, where at the end of the day, once you're in this situation, it doesn't matter why this happened. Once you're in it, all that matters is that you're in a insanely violent situation, life and death, mm -hmm. ultra violent situation where you're just trying to survive. And it doesn't matter who you're taking orders from. These people didn't even, don't even know <laughs> essentially what they're fighting for or why they're fighting. They, they just see that someone is trying to kill them. So they're trying to kill them first. Yeah. That the way that you just described the film definitely does make me interested to check this out. I, I was originally going to go to the screening of this and then I had surgery the next day. So that obviously did not happen. But I'm interested in this. Alex Garland is a filmmaker who I have kind of complicated feelings about. I think Ex Machina is incredible. I still think that's his most well execute executed movie front to back yeah what and what an i think incredible his other first film i mean yeah it's it's, it's unreal that yeah. movie just absolutely rocks one of the best sci-fi movies of the 2010s annihilation is still like i can't get the taste out of my mouth of how height i was for that movie and then it kind of never reached the highs that i wanted it to outside of the very end which is to be fair, like as high as it possibly gets, but I, I, he's a filmmaker that I do have complicated feelings about. I have heard the flip coin, the flip side of the coin from what you have argued for civil war in that it's just like centrist bullshit that like in 2024, like nobody has time for something that doesn't actually, that isn't going to make a statement one way or another. Well, like especially it, it given given the, the polarization that we have in this country, like the yeah. reality. And it's a, it's an election year yeah. and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I, it, honestly, like leading up to the release of this movie, it's just like it just feels irresponsible to release a movie called Civil War uh, leading up to this election that we have. And just, you know, the the reality of the the polarization we have. But I do think that. The point that Garland, one, at least one of the points that he's trying to make with this is that the, the inherently the polarization is the problem because it gets you to a point where there, there is a breaking point and you can't find common ground and it doesn't matter the reasons why shit hits the fan once you once it does there's no going back so i i don't think that the movie is a home run i i, I don't think that it's it's i don't know i i'm very curious to see like how it does it, it with the test of time you know once we're removed from mm -hmm. it once it's not this immediate thing that we're dealing with right now um because in a vacuum i think it is a very very well-made movie but it's so difficult to to watch it and digest it and separate it from this current moment you know it's you can't you can't 
watch a movie like this and not think about the current state of America right, right now. And I, right. I think that's that's where the trouble is. Um, and the movie, it's not like the movie is trying to remove itself. It's it's very much leaning into that. It's it's set in America. It's about America. <laughs> You know, it's they would have they would have come up with an with another country with a fictional country or something. You know, if if that yeah. wasn't the case, like he is he's actively trying to lean into it. So you yeah, it's you like have to, poking the bear, but then like kind of running away from the bear once it's all riled up. Yeah, like it's just like exactly. now you you do this. I'm gonna make a story that's not what you want it to be. It's not gonna give you the answers that you're looking for. And I think you're right. I I don't think that all things should have to be inherent. I mean, all everything is inherently political, but like I don't think that it has to be side left or side right. I think that there's other stories that aren't about like to be the opposite of Shogun. For example, we were talking about earlier. We need to also have stories that investigate the people who aren't in the back rooms dealing with the future of the country. Right. We need to see those stories as well. But I, I also feel like if he would have push things in a certain direction i think the movie would have been worse i think the version of this mm. movie that's like overtly talking about democrats and republicans and and trying yeah, to suck. to very <laughs> much like make it very clear how what led to this war i i really feel like that would have been worse i i, I don't think that that's the better version of the movie so it's tough it's tough because you know, he made the choice to keep it vague, and I feel like that's part of the trouble. But I also feel like diving directly into that and, and, and fully exploring that to the extent where I think a lot of people were hoping it would, I, I don't think that's the better option. Maybe the better yeah. option was not to make the movie at all. I don't know. <laughs> not make it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But just sitting here watching the movie, I, I think that it is very fascinating very interesting. Like I said before, just one of those where I'm just willing to read all the reviews and just look at all the different angles, all the different interpretations, um, because it's there's just a lot there. There's a lot to unpack, even if some things feel a little bit silly and a little bit kind mm -hmm. of, you know, weightless. Um, I do want to talk about the performances. Kirsten Dunst, Wagner Mora. Kaylee Spaney, Nick Offerman, Stephen Mc, uh, McKinley Henderson, all very, very strong. Um, the Kaylee Spaney character, she's the young girl. She uh, was in Priscilla as Priscilla. Yeah, big, the, big 12 months for uh, Kaylee Spaney. Here. Yeah, uh, that's the character that I had the most trouble with. Um, I don't know enough about photography. I don't know about war zone photography. It did feel very, very silly at times to see this girl just running around with a camera in the middle of a fucking war zone. <laughs> I was just like, I, I don't know about this. I, <laughs> but we need to has has friend of the pod Harry watched this yet? He, like, he needs to chime as, in with this as a photographer and a journalist, and like my boy is a sucker for any kind of journalism movie like spotlight is one of his favorite movies ever i want to see his take on civil war yeah i want to see how in the bag he is for it <laughs> i don't know i i had a lot of trouble with that i i think she's talented i i'm not knocking her performance i think it's just garland's idea of like let's have her be like in the shit and it's just like what what is happening what are we doing um Kirsten Dunst, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Please, let's go back to giving Kirsten Dunst more lead roles. What what happened? How long has it been mm -hmm. <laughs> since we had her like be the lead in a movie? Um, she's so good in this. Uh, carries a lot of sadness in her performance, which is interesting because you know. Garland has on the press tour talked a lot about how the whole point of this movie is just to be in the perspective of the journalist and just to observe, right? And to be as objective as possible for the movie to be as objective as possible, just like the characters. But clearly this is a, a woman who is very haunted 
and and clearly very very affected by everything that's happening everything she's seeing and 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 the the horrors of what she's capturing so i kind of wish that we would have gotten a little bit more you know i i understand the the whole point of trying to be objective and not really let you into to the feelings and the you know the the inside uh thoughts and emotions but she's doing so much with her face in this movie mm. where you can just tell the the toll that this work is taking on her it's it's a really really incredible performance and then um wagner mora who folks may know fans of um he plays pablo escobar in narcos i think is like his biggest role um oh, okay but i would love to see him in more stuff because he's very very good in this um he kind of embodies like the junkie like the adrenaline junkie thrill seeker you know where he's like i want to feel like i am going to die <laughs> i want to run into these fucking battles and just feel that thrill right so he's kind of like that madman who's like this is this is how i feel alive is to do this work um it's it's a it's a really cool performance and then our boy stephen mckinley henderson he's kind of the you know the the older journalist the the guy who's been around for a while um he gets a really great moment i will not spoil it but people fucking cheered in the theater <laughs> oh. when uh he does a thing and it is absolutely phenomenal uh also shout out jesse plemons um who's very good in his one scene that he gets uh the closest the movie gets to actually giving you any kind of background into what's actually happening um you know and and the character he plays is is very much like a, a type of guy we can all uh say that we know to some extent um a very sort of i'd say white nationalists yeah, he's, he's that guy, guy that you went to high school with, uh, who you just see his Facebook posts now, and you're like, oh, this, yeah, this that, is that's what, you're what he's up to, up to now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so between that scene and then the, the little bit that you get of Nick Offerman as the president, the movie does, it does have a point of view. It, I, I, I know it does. It's just extremely obscured, and it's not overt. Um, I won't give away the ending of this movie, um, but sort of the final moments of it, the, the final few images, Garland is, is clearly trying to say something. He's clearly trying to say something about, um, you know, the way journalism has evolved in the modern era. Um, cause th there is still a disconnect here in terms of just seeing like photographers capturing things and not on a camera and not like on a cell phone right so you can't help but think like okay aren't journalists now a little bit irrelevant if everybody has a camera that they can capture things with and we're not really seeing that in this movie um and so there's there's a little bit of a button at the end of the movie that recontextualizes is a lot of those feelings and makes you feel like he he is trying to make a point and you know you go through this whole movie thinking that these journalists are the heroes of the story and once you get to the end you think hmm maybe not maybe garland has a little bit of a more darker cynical take on the state of modern journalism and the state of just how i think war and america's involvement in wars is portrayed in the media so mm. i don't i don't want to get into too many more specifics i i don't want to yeah. start spoiling stuff but no I, I'm like i said there's a lot there to unpack i'm definitely interested in checking this out i i think that if anything like without a doubt alex garland is a filmmaker with ideas and he is a filmmaker who i don't want to necessarily say that he and he embarks out to provoke people but like i think that he does have that that ability to him and because of that like I, i'm interested in seeing 
this film for that reason. It's definitely um, worth seeing and, and having your own take on it for sure. I did just want to shout out, remember uh, to dunk on our boys from earlier, Benioff and, Vi- Benioff and Weiss, remember uh, the Confederate TV show that was supposed to oh, come yeah, out? Right, it, it was supposed to come out this year uh, originally, whenever it was first set to be made, or maybe it was supposed to come out yet last year or something um, of the story of what if the Confederacy won the Civil War? Oof. And thank God this movie isn't that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Or that that show just doesn't exist. So that was a win. So that's yes. Civil War. Uh, I am very curious to hear what you think about it when you see it. Um, I also had a chance to see Challengers which is not out yet. It comes out, I believe next week, um, the 26th of April, I believe is when it opens. Um, so I had a chance to see it early. This movie was supposed to come out like last year, got pushed because of the strikes. Um, and now it's finally coming out. Boy, oh boy, I fucking love this movie. It is so good. Um, I'm a big Luca Guadagnino head. I haven't seen all of his movies, uh, but I've seen his last four. So he did Call Me By Your Name, uh, Suspiria, Bones and All, and now Challengers. And I think all four of these movies are as close to 10 out of 10s as you can get. Is Challengers my favorite one of his? I don't know. Maybe... Maybe it's number two behind Suspiria. I'm wow. not sure. I, I think okay. I I think it's definitely better than Call Me By Your Name and Bones and All, for sure. So I'd put it, if it's not number one, it's definitely number two. Um, but I, I want to go back and watch all his other stuff. He has a you know pretty robust filmography going back a few years. Um, but as far as this this run that he's on right now of kind of breaking out more in the in the states man this guy is so talented and very different movies right like you have it, it challengers is is closest to call me by your name but even call me by your name is just like this really soft um romantic movie then you have obviously a cannibal romance and then the suspira remake which is just this crazy fucking witch uh bloody possession movie uh challengers is a tennis movie it's a sports movie and the way he approaches it is so fucking cool he basically takes a single tennis match and breaks it out over the length of this entire movie we start with with the beginning of this tennis match and we end with the last moments of the tennis match and throughout this entire movie we're flashing back through time and it's informing the character's investment in this tennis match so that by the end you're so you're so tapped in you're so wired into the emotions going into this and man the performances are just so magnetic this is such a steamy horny sexy movie like it it is just there are scenes in this movie where my jaw was on the floor i was like i cannot believe the sexual tension on screen right now this is crazy there are sparks flying off the screen right now i can i can see the fireworks just popping off the the projector is shaking (laughs) it is such a good movie Um, I'll be curious to see, you know, what the dissenting opinion is once this actually comes out and more people see it, but I was really blown away by it. I'm sure that there's going to be nitpicks. You know, I think that there might be a lot of people that say that it's a little bit style over substance and, you know, we could have gotten into these characters a little bit more, but man, they're, they're fucking knocking it out of the park. It's so good. Like they're, these performances are amazing. They're I buy these characters completely. I was so immersed in their story. These are not good people. They're not good to each other. They're <laughs> they're treating each other badly. <laughs> they're manipulating and lying to each other. And we love to see it. It's great. <laughs> love that. Cheat on your tennis husband. <laughs> 
it's uh I'm it's a so guarantee for for, this movie. for my top 10 of the year i'd be very very wow. shocked if it's okay not, i'd be very shocked if it's not in my top five honestly it i Holy loved it shit. so much man i love to hear that i i'm so excited for this movie this is one of my most anticipated movies last year and then got pushed this year so like I I cannot fucking wait to see this thing. And I can't believe Luca has another movie that's coming out this year. Yeah, Queer. Yeah. With, um, with Daniel with Craig. Daniel Craig. Yeah, I, yeah, I hope that I, comes out. I think it is that. Isn't that playing at. Uh, at uh, can? Was that a, can? At, on the, on the can land lineup? I thought that it was, but I could be wrong uh maybe not i could be wrong um that would be very soon after challengers just coming out i can't wait to see this uh i've heard nothing but like even like the things that i've heard about the movie that aren't necessarily 100 percent positive do have me all in um i really need to go back and give call me by your name another chance i think i was the most lukewarm on that movie uh out of the three of us whenever it came out uh but i mean the army I hammer like of it all i don't know if yeah. it's gonna oh, age oh, yeah. super uh, well i mean but i like you like his last three movies are all just stone cold bangers and so i i'm so happy to hear that he's got another one in the tank here yeah, we we were all definitely not as high on um on Bones and all. Um, I still really love that movie, but I think we all said that that one could have been a little better. Um, I think this movie, this movie is pretty fucking close to perfect, in my opinion. I mean, again, like I said, I'm sure there's things you can nitpick, but. There's just an energy to this movie. Oh my God, dude. The Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross score. Holy fucking shit. It is <laughs> such a banger. It is so propulsive. It's shades of like LCD sound system. Like oh, just this shit. driving high energy beat that makes you feel like you're at a tennis match. Just back and forth and back and forth and go, go, go. And they're, the filmmaking choices in a lot of the tennis matches themselves, because um, something Luca is doing here is he wants you to feel like the entire movie is a tennis match, even if you're not watching tennis. Like these people, their lives are so consumed by this that every interaction that they have each other is a tennis match, right? So that's the 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 place that he wants to put you in as a viewer. But then when you actually are in a in a tennis match the filmmaking is incredible there's moments where you're uh, above the court and then underneath the court and then you are the racket and then you are the ball and you're getting tossed around it's insane what he's doing it's uh, i could not get enough of it i could have watched i could have watched an, another hour of this movie like when it ended i was like no <laughs> please <laughs> keep going <laughs> oh it's Man. so good it's i can't so good. wait i'm this is absolutely gonna be like a friday night see it with the see it with the peoples i hope that people actually do go out and see this movie yeah I hope i'm so really too. interested box office wise like it's gonna be a real test than, for uh zendaya's like movie yeah. star status i think that this movie is going to be they're they're trying to market this as like maybe not like a 100 mil movie or something like that but this is going to be a movie that i think is going to get some butts and seats because of zendaya uh but yeah you're right no this will be a full test more so than dune of like what is her star power really yeah. look like in movies and uh our boys mike feist and josh o'connor they're really really phenomenal in this movie i i don't want to give any specifics as to what actually happens in this movie but a lot of it is hinted at in the trailer and boy, oh boy, do we have some real bisexual representation in cinema. And it is Hell crackling. Yeah, it is crackling. <laughs> and Zendaya, ugh, man, her her character is just so crazy in this movie where she is she she's playing tennis with these boys. That's <laughs> she is yeah. playing them. Yeah, she is. <laughs> it is nuts. I 
I'm definitely going to see it again. I cannot wait to see it again. It is so good. Uh, it's Challengers. It's the new film by Luca Guadagnino. It is out in theaters uh, April 26th, right around the corner. All right. Before we close out, we got to talk about a nasty little midnight movie called Late Night with the Devil. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a super under the radar movie. It's uh, being released by Shudder, the horror streaming service. It stars along with like about 27 other production studios, according to the pre movie uh, credits that oh, came out. Yeah, um, it's ex it's literally like the bit. It's the, it's the, the family, family guy, guy bit of it, <laughs> like, oh, an animated movie. Oh, it's still movie. going. Oh, it's still going. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, this this movie, I feel like would otherwise be this kind of uneventful, just nothing movie where it just gets plopped onto a streaming service. There's a bit of a of a of a hype around this movie. There was a, there was some controversy with it using um, a couple AI generated images um but i i don't know i th these these directors i think this is their first film yeah this is yeah uh yeah cameron and colin cairns but it's our boy david dasmalchian who has just been a that guy you know he just has a face he's an everything from oppenheimer yeah. to dune to ant-man he's specifically like a big boy for probably the two biggest Hollywood filmmakers that we have right now between Nolan and uh, Denis Villeneuve in their movies. Yeah, he's like the, in. the thread that ties them together between Oppenheimer and Prisoners and Blade Runner 2049 and The Dark Knight. And he just kind of like bounces back and forth. Yeah, and I think I'm glad this movie is getting a theatrical release. I'm, I'm glad it's not just going straight to Shutter. Yeah. I, I feel like that's why it is building more of an audience and it is getting seen more than otherwise would have if it would just go straight to shutter um but lee my my wife she for some reason really locked into this movie um we we have this habit now of just watching a bunch of trailers i there was a time in my life when i swore off trailers and would never watch a trailer and my wife has fully converted me away from that where we're uh you know hooked on mainlining trailers and this one was one of the ones that she really locked into for some reason so she really wanted to go see it we went to the enzian to see it and she loved it so much like i think this is definitely her favorite movie of the year one of the her top movies of the last few years she was so so captivated by it I really loved it. I think that there are some limitations with the budget. It's a it's a fairly low budget film, um, and there's a couple things that I feel like okay, I could I could feel the low budget here. Like you didn't <laughs> quite get to where you wanted, but the use of practical effects just blew me away. Like there are some sequences in this movie where I was like, think god they didn't do cgi this is so fucking cool that they actually built this that they did the this you know uh gross out uh <laughs> special effects <laughs> stuff yeah because it is it is so so good that man is actually just like looks like he is projectile vomiting black sludge uh <laughs> and yeah. yeah now i I really love this movie. Um, this is, it's definitely a movie. It's not flawless with I doubt a lot of that does come down to the budget that you're talking about. Like the practical effects for the most part look great. Some of the digital effects look not so great, um, but there's a charm. But, there's a charm to a lot of it, even if it yeah, doesn't look great. Yeah. I think that this is, this is one of uh like a period piece kind of style. I like the type of period piece. Now we aren't talking about like the witch or something like that, but like trying to capture that seventies aesthetic, it does that just about as well as any type of found footage 
uh, period piece film that I have seen before of capturing what if you have watched episodes of Johnny Carson either live if you're old enough or like on Pluto TV like I will throw on sometimes this movie is kind of nailing that tone and that vibe with like the color palette that it's capturing and some of like the zany style things that you might see whenever somebody is going to come on there. Obviously this is going to the nth degree because this is Halloween night and this is a, a movie and whatever. But like, I think this does an incredible job of that. David S. Malkian, man, I think that this is kind of like the role of a lifetime for him. I'm so He's happy so good. that he finally got his chance to be in a movie like this. But I got to give it shout outs to our boy, Kellen and Cameron Cairns, because they kind of nailed it. Like they kind of did exactly what you want to do, what you want to see whenever you have a a small indie style budget horror movie like this. Like it's just it it's really well executed. The ending is a little bit like we've reach the 90 minute mark we got to tie up everything really quickly like that's if we're going to really pick nits i think that that's where some of the issues come down is in that third act but it's a movie that i really like in the horror genre where like yeah you kind of know exactly where it's going to go from step one but it's about the journey to get to the crazy explosion yeah. that you know is going to happen so we let's let's talk a little bit more specific so if if folks don't know or or you know we're we're gonna essentially spoil uh some parts of the movie so we can actually talk about it um but basically the the basic setup is uh does small chain plays a tv show host that wants to boost his ratings and there's a chance to do that by inviting a uh a girl that is possessed with a demon onto his show and do a live uh, conversation with the demon through the girl on live television. That's essentially kind of the, the main crux of the film. And there's some other things that happen um, where I did feel a little bit like, okay, you know, we kind of have to fill the time with some other things <laughs> with Chris, Chris new or uh, <laughs> our guy, Chris, Stu, our boy. And then the, the other guy who's like the skeptic that's trying to knock everything down. And, you know, it, it, it worked fairly well, but everything's hinging. Everything's building to this moment where we actually get to see this, this girl, like, go full exorcist mode essentially and i thought that that part of the movie where where we get the the promise of that fulfilled incredible like truly truly phenomenal stuff there there's a stretch of this movie where all hell starts to break loose and it's like man we did it we're here it's it's <laughs> we are firing on all cylinders and i think that there's a couple moments where we come off of that and i couldn't help but think like okay why <laughs> why don't we get back to that let's let's stay on that energy this what mm -hmm. i'm watching right now is not as good as what i was just watching five minutes ago and you know the, i think the, the movie suffers a little bit from that where you just you're promised this really amazing thing and they nail it and then everything else sort of feels a little bit lesser it's yeah. it's not like it falls apart or anything like that i i do feel like you know going back to the 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 whole found footage thing i think the movie does a good job of selling this idea of you you are watching the actual show and it smartly shows you the behind the scenes stuff in black and white to stylistically delineate like, Hey, you know, this is not the found footage stuff, but it's still important for the story. But I think it, it very creatively sells that concept of like, we're going to put you into, into the full world of this talk show. 
And when we cut away from it, um, it's not going to be as jarring. It's it's going to be a, a stylistic choice that that fits within that. So I think the entire package works really well. It's just that 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 main event is so so good. I thought it was so well mm. done that it kind of outshines everything else. Yeah, a hundred percent. You're right. That's and going back to what you were saying about the practical effects, like that is just a thing where it's like. Listen, at the end of the day, there's a reason why uh, 50 years later, The Exorcist is still like the scariest horror movie that you will ever watch. And it's because when done right, practical effects like that and the the upsetting nature of what you're seeing can just work better than any kind of like digitally created piece of horror. Another big thing that sells this movie is Got to give a shout out where we were talking about David Desmalkian to uh, the girl who plays Lily, Ingrid Torelli. Um, yeah, she's just a really incredible good. performance. Uh, Very creepy. The way before she turns like her just kind of staring at the camera. <laughs> it's so good. That she does or just like. <laughs> The way that she will like call a certain adult by their name, but in a way that's like throws off everybody around them. I really awesome performance by her. Like I thought that she kills it. And then of course, like she does get to do the big flashy showy thing after the turn comes. Uh, Cause that's just her and all of that makeup right there. Yeah. It, th- that makeup was so good. It almost looked like a different actor completely. Yeah. It's, it's very transformative. I looked it up afterwards. I was because also the voice modification, and everything. Yeah. I was like, did they get a second girl to do like Lily post, uh, post demon coming through her Abraxas or whatever the fuck demon it is. That's coming, <laughs> manifesting itself through her, but no, it's just her. So, uh, amazing job by her. I, I really like some of the, side characters that they brought into this story like i think that 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 build up yeah it it maybe does it go like five to ten minutes long maybe but like it gets I the like job the done chris, it, it I sets like the, the chris mood do. i like chris do as a character i really love the guy ian bliss who plays the the magician turned skeptic Um, he's like a classic type of guy that you need that, like that skeptic voice in a movie like this. And he's somebody who's going to annoy you as a viewer, like while you're watching the movie. (laughs) But like, I think that he was like, he, he did the job really well. Uh, how the movie kind of explores hypnosis and how that works was really, really fun and really interesting thing. That that's one thing about the third act that did work really well for me was Yeah, when they kind of double back that whole piece. and show you the the non-hypnosis yeah. side. Yeah. That was really cool. That was sick. That was really, really cool uh piece of filmmaking that I hadn't quite seen something that looked quite like that in a horror movie before. And that's what at the end of the day, like there's hundreds of horror movies made every year uh i am always appreciative whenever it's something that it's just like well i've never quite seen that done like that before and that's one thing that uh i gotta give credit to this film that there's there's plenty of those moments that yeah we've seen found footage movies we've seen movies that are trying to emulate this certain type of style of course we've seen a billion exorcist movies but like Nothing that quite had a package like this. Yeah, it's it's a great idea. You know, it's like oh, let's, incredible premise. Let's do awesome let's premise. do a a live a found footage of a live show that has like a demon exorcism in it. Like that's just such a cool idea for a movie. I think they absolutely delivered on it. Sure, there's some yeah. things that maybe were a little uh, short of their of the mark but i don't think that that's that big of a deal i think that as far as horror movies go like there's so much shit out there you know they they just they pump so much garbage out that i think that this one it's even if it's not perfect it it feels like a gem you know Mm -hmm. i think like well also we were kind of due for a good horror movie year. I think last year sucked for horror. I was, I, I think I mentioned it on one of our year end pods that 
I was really disappointed with a lot of the stuff. Like we got Infinity Pool was honestly a big letdown for me. A movie that I was really excited about from uh, Brandon Cronenberg. We got the new Exorcist movie, which was like Poo-poo-ca-ca. as sloppy as slop can get. Uh, I never saw Evil Dead Rise. I've heard that that was at least fun, but like uh, another Insidious movie. Uh, it was a lot of like the the IP stuff did not work. And then there wasn't really any good like indie stuff that worked through. Like honestly, looking at my list, I think the highest rated movie that I have that has horror elements is Bo is Afraid. And that's <laughs> a very different type yeah. of horror that you're watching that's on screen. Something else. I, but like this this year is already looking so much more promising with this, with uh Quiet Place Day One that's coming. Um of course Even some of the stuff that's, to towards the year. Stuff that's already out like um Immaculate and the first omen have been getting really good reviews. I've heard Immaculate is kind of is kind of crap. Um, I've, I've heard that it's like a happy for you, Sydney Sweeney, but like <laughs> I don't know about this one, Chief. Uh, but I've, I also I've heard great things about Lisa Frankenstein. Um, that's like as far as like horror comedy goes. So I saw the I'm, TV I'm glow glad. looks great. I cannot wait for that. Um, cannot wait for that. There's something I, called Long Legs with Nick Cage. Yes, Long Legs, that's coming out this year. Uh, the Speak No Evil remake that I am very hyped about with our boy Scoot. So, horror's back, baby. Uh, oh, In a Violent Nature, which I think is... I think that that's playing at the Florida Film Festival, if I'm not mistaken. It's having its, like, East Coast premiere. Um, by the time that uh, we put up this podcast, this might have already played. But... Um, yeah, no, there's a lot of great stuff that is uh, in the works for this year. And I'm I'm excited to see where Late Night and the Devil is going to end up on my list. Right now it is my number two movie of the year. Now, Grid, it's very early in the year. I have not seen hey, a lot you of haven't, stuff. You haven't seen The Beekeeper. Well, that's hor- horrific in some other ways, right? <laughs> my my, I'm going to be honest. It's tough right now. <laughs> My top movies of the year. Uh, Driveway Dolls is number three right now because like it's not not been a lot of great. Dune part two should be like on a tier and then the drop off of all drop offs after that. So it's going to be hopefully fun to more see good stuff to come. It, it, what unseats Dune two, if anything, I for me, probably nothing. But for everyone it's, else, it's like what's what's going to be the thing i think challengers might be a a big a big hitter for a lot of people it might that would i mean man if zendaya just fully owns like three months of the movie year then woof we're we're fully we're fully in the zendaya season at this point joker 2 maybe the trailer came out we watched it jesus christ yeah i'm gonna did you do i I don't know if anybody noticed. Like, I, I don't even think that you guys noticed it, but oh, there's this the, like the really smile. You know, this it was this really subtle choice that Todd Haynes did. That like I don't think that most people won't get it because it's so difficult to do, and no one's <laughs> ever done this before. Where Harley draws a little smiley with lipstick on the glass, and then Joaquin he he moves he moves his little mouth over and he smiles and, 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 and the it looks camera, like he's wearing a the makeup. The camera, the shot lines it up. That's I. That's an incredible cinema. I want somebody to hate crime Todd Haynes. Um, <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts on Late Night with the Devil or anything else before we wrap up? Um. No, good movie. I'm glad that we got to talk about some good stuff. There's uh we haven't done a lot of catch up this year and kind of for some good reason. Oh, actually one other point that I want to make about Late Night of the Devil. Very very smart choices to know uh like it kind of knows its limitations and thank god we did not dive into the cult or whatever it is. Yeah. That I had the same uh, um, thought. <laughs> our boy Jack Delroy was delving into that would have sucked. Like uh, most movies will try to have some kind of exposition or something else. Instead, we just get ominous woods. You get people in cloaks and it's like, cool, I got it. Apparently after the movie talked with a uh, roommate friend of the pod, Christine, um, and she was saying that's based off of a famous Hollywood cult. 
I did not know that. It did not matter to me whatsoever. I, I got the gist. Uh, I got the gist of what's happening. The shorthand was there. Shit. Uh, that I was like, okay, cool. I'm just glad that we did not dive more into that. Instead, it stays grounded yeah. in that one studio. I, I did think there was maybe a little bit too much uh, voiceover narration to kind of get through all that. Uh, well, they got Michael exposition. Ironside. So they, yep. had to, they had to really pay that check to Michael Ironside. Exactly. <laughs> That's the thing is you do get that nice voice of... Uh, uh michael ironside who is uh isn't he like megatron or something he actually did voice ultra magnus in transformers prime so not the one i thought but i was close is that, is that what you're thinking of? is that is that it all right well we can wrap it up there thank you all for listening please rate review subscribe like and comment let us know your thoughts on everything we talked about on this episode check out webottomike.net to get every episode in your inbox donate at patreon.com slash webottomike thank you all donors for supporting this podcast next week the plan is to dive back into our tom v tom series with forrest gump big one seismic one is I think it's the biggest the biggest movie we've covered. I mean, we covered some big ones. Like Top Gun is a big movie. Rain Man is a big movie. But I feel like Forrest Gump is like fucking seismic movie. Yeah, Forrest Gump is going to thread those needles between being the biggest movie of the year, one of, and also winning Best Picture. So, right. Excited to talk yeah. about it. See you then. Bye. Bye.